Greetings, my beautiful people. Welcome to Flow with Armand Asadi. Here's the deal. I'm going to get right into it. Today, you are going to learn from the world's preeminent expert on podcasting. There are so many people out there in this industry that are teaching it to try to make money off you that are full of shit. And I'm telling you, when I sat down to think, who can I talk to about podcasting? And also, by the way, this Clubhouse app that is just like on fire right now, growing like crazy and has so much of the attention currency of the internet. Who can I talk to that really fucking knows this stuff? Who really can sit down with me and chop it up and flow with me and go into the important matters that would help somebody like you determine if they should have a podcast. And if you already do, how to have a top ranked podcast in the world that's top 100 in your category. Steve is the guy that you should be listening to and here's why, and we're gonna cut right into it. So first of all, Steve is a veteran. He's a 30 year entrepreneur and he's the founder of the podcast magazine, like literally the podcast magazine. He also is a New York Times bestselling author, so he's done that as well. He's the author of What Is Your What? And he's an OG internet entrepreneur. This guy founded, is the founder of liquor.com. And that is just like a brief snippet of his resume and what he's done. And you will see for yourself why we should all be listening to Steve. And I had an amazing conversation with him. So before we dive into it, hit that subscribe button as we like to say, as we like to say on the YouTubes, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button if this is helpful for you. Make sure to share it with a friend and just take a look at the description below. There are tons of helpful links that I'm adding in there with you adding in there for you. God, I'm stumbling my way through. <laughs> it's keeping it real. There are tons of description uh, links in there with uh, just links to various resources and things that I thought would be helpful for you, for your entrepreneurial journey, for your podcasting journey. And there's show notes as well. So you can jump around and go through different parts of this conversation with Steve because I think it was super, super helpful. My favorite part was his clubhouse strategy. All right, that's enough. Subscribe, like, and tune into the conversation. Enjoy. So, Steve, one of the things I've been thinking about this morning, and I always prepare for these by just really putting myself in the position of, uh, you know, what is it like to be in your world? And as I look at the brand that you've developed uh, in a very short span of time, actually, it's absolutely uh, not only courageous, but bad fucking ass. The way you just came out and you're like, I'm going to own the podcast industry. Like, true. I'm just going to take over. Like, I'm not building some brand that's called like podcast magic or, you know, build your next podcast. It's like, no, yes, you, you obviously had your own podcasts. You've obviously been in this space for, space for quite some time, but you just came right out and you're like, I'm going to dominate with a magazine. I'm going to dominate clubhouse. I'm going to build a group. I'm going to do all these things. So my question for you would be, like, say I was one of your new employees and we were in a meeting and this was just kind of like a quarterly planning or an annual planning. And somebody says, Steve, like, what's the vision here? What are we doing? How does this all fit together? And where is it going? I would love to hear the vision you have for all of this because I'm sure I'm sure it's fucking huge. No, it's a great it's a great question. And uh, and I hope that my uh, my my president and COO watches this because um She's argued for a long time that we have clear vision and we have clear goals. Um, I'm not so sure that's the case. <laughs> so, so maybe something I, I'll, I'll say here will actually reflect that we do have a clear goal and, and clear vision. You know, and it's, it's interesting, right? Because the, the new media landscape is, is evolving every single day, right? Every single moment. I mean, like, even if you look at Clubhouse as an example, two months ago, it wasn't even my radar. So for yeah. the people who are sitting there going, you know, oh, I'm too busy. I can't do this. Like, you know, I was one of those guys, right? Like, I just, I've got all kinds of stuff going on. I can't do this. I can't do that. Man, I haven't put that thing down. I know. So it's like, <laughs> what? So where did I find that time, right? So like, so you look at your goals, you look at your vision. Clubhouse wasn't even on the radar. I think December 14th, I, I was about to pick up my phone and check. But if I pick up my phone and check, I'll probably get lost in Clubhouse. Yeah, line, yeah. So I'm not even going to pick it up. Um, but the reality is December 14th, I think is the day that I finally opened up an account and I had heard about it for a while. You couldn't, you couldn't have predicted it. You just mm. couldn't have predicted it. So, so the reality is, I mean, as far as podcast magazine, as far as the vision is concerned, yeah, we don't want to be one of 2 million odd podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. We, we have a podcast, but the, but the real MO was, okay, how do we stop being one of 2 million podcasts and create a category of one? 
so that we really dominate the conversation mm-hmm. around podcasting. And, and frankly, that wasn't going to happen based on the merits uh, of our shows alone. Mm. So instead of trying to carve that path through the show, you're essentially carving that path through a brand and that brand has the magazine association to it, which is very cool, by the way, that you're printing these out physically. This isn't just some digital magazine, like that's awesome. Uh, you've had some incredible people on the cover. What what was the thought before Clubhouse? Like, it yeah. was like, uh, yeah, what was the vision before Clubhouse? Because I would love to go into Clubhouse because so many people, sure. including myself, uh, made the time for Clubhouse and are wondering to themselves, and you may not have all the answers, man, this thing is evolving yeah. daily, but it's like, how does this all tie together? How do I take one single macro level effort and tie it together in a way where I can republish or redistribute or uh, recreate myself and spread my voice and my message, or at least the message of other people. I'm really curious how it all ties together, but what was it before Clubhouse? Like, what was the idea for the brand? So I, I think that the fundamental question that every entrepreneur has to has to be able to answer, Aman, is just, it's just like, what conversation do you most want to be a part of? Right, like, like, and you have to be able to answer that in, in, in one or two words. Because I think that so many, 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 many people, especially entrepreneurs, especially solopreneurs, yeah. just kind of get caught up in the whole, let me just try this, let me be that. And, and they don't really have that degree of focus in terms of this is the conversation that I most want to dominate. And so for us, uh, about, I'm going to say about two and a half, three years ago, we really became clear that the way we answer the question of what conversation do we most want to be a part of and answering that in just one or two words, that answer became podcasting. Mm. Right. And so as soon as we knew that we, we don't want to give up on this space, that we really do love this industry and we really do want to be a part of this industry. That was the question is, is how do we make that happen? And so having a podcast is great, but at the end of the day, having a podcast only takes you so far unless you have hugely deep pockets or you've got a, a, you know, a, a network behind you that does a lot of the heavy lifting. So that's really where the idea for Podcast Magazine came in was how is there not a Rolling Stone type magazine Mm. for this world? How is there not a Sports Illustrated type magazine for this world? And for whatever reason, magazines still have cachet. You know, they they still have appeal. And at the end of the day, what, what I know to be true is that we as an industry have largely been fighting this whole conversation of, oh, it's just this cute little hobbyist kind of thing. It's a closet type industry where, you know, there's a, there's a handful of people that might like what's going on there, but at the end of the day, it's never going to compete with A or compete with B or compete with C. So for us, it was an opportunity really to validate the industry. And we felt like if we, if we put ourselves at the hub of the wheel, like if you think about how a bicycle wheel looks and how all the spokes kind of connect to the yes. center of that wheel, that was that's what we tried to figure out is like, how do we put ourselves at that hub of the wheel while really elevating the industry as a whole? Mm. And so that was that was the goal is is look, let's do our part to legitimize what's going on here and 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 do this in a way that that people can look at and they go, yeah, this is, this is really well done. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't want to just create a newsletter. We didn't want to just create something that talked about podcasting. We really didn't want to, I don't know. We really, not that we have anything uh, against the podcast journal type um, publications that are out there, but we felt like, you know, look, if there's, if there's a million active podcasters, there's 112 million active podcast listeners Mm -hmm. just in the United States. So let's go after that bigger piece of the pie and and really focus on podcasting and podcast culture that was more driven towards the the fan than than trying to help the podcaster become a better podcaster, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
again, I have to give you kudos, man, because I, I you know, I've, I've done similar things in different spaces where I've thought about how do you step into such a saturated industry and really stand out. And obviously there's things like, well, just step into a different industry that doesn't exist. Blue ocean, that thing. Just get out of the red ocean, get out of the bloodbath. That's one yeah. way to be extremely innovative. The other way is to be the godfather of it all, to show mm-hmm. up as the one that brings it all together, the hub and spoke model. I'll never forget. I don't know if you got it from, if you came up with this or whatever. I remember a long time ago, I heard Chris Gillibo, the author of the $100 Startup and a few other books as well. He kind of made a similar analogy to this hub and spoke model, but more in regards to how you build your own business. Like where is every, and this was back in the day of like blogging. It was like your blog is your home base on the internet and social media are the little spokes that tie into it. And it always resonated with me and stuck with me no matter what I've done, but it's difficult at times to really generate the amount of interest and conversation and uh, make it deeply resonate in an industry that is extremely right now fragmented by a lot of high quality podcasts, as you said. And you really can't sure. do that with just one incredible podcast or two, <laughs> you know, in your, in your situation. It's like, it's not quite enough. And so it is really, truly brilliant the way you just came in and took over. I remember when we were first engaging about this, it's like you were just asking me, like, who, who do you know that would deserve to be on the cover of this magazine? And you were already thinking so big about everything that you were trying to do. So massive, massive congratulations on what you've done so far. I'm curious as someone who's at the, at the center of this, people often argue about where podcasting is at and how uh, evolved, let's just say it already is. If 100% was the line at which the maximum number of active podcasts occur. And after that point, we've reached a threshold. Where are we at today? I think, honestly, we are at 100 in terms of the number of bad shows that should be released. <laughs> so <laughs> please, please, you know, let's not release any more bad shows that aren't listenable. And, and the reality is, look, I mean, the, the beautiful thing, and I'm being a little facetious here, but the, the beautiful thing about podcasting is that the barrier to entry is very, very low. Yeah. And anybody yeah. can start a podcast, which on one hand is great. And, and, and you, can, you can see this across the board in the different channels, that it's, that it's truly awesome that people can do that. And, and no matter what channel it is, like blogging, et cetera, right? Where there's no barrier to entry, it, it's great that people can do that. At the same token, what I will say is... For every bad show, so to speak, where the audio is not great and the production value is is an afterthought, uh, and the person who is, if they're hosting someone, they haven't done any research to really find out as as much as they possibly can about that person, and, and the conversation ultimately just becomes a conversation that doesn't add real value for the listener. Mm-hmm. I mean that that is a problem. Right. And, and I think everyone can create a show that can add real value for listeners. They just might have to do a little bit of homework. They may have to hi- yeah, hire yeah. somebody to help them. I mean, anyone has the ability to create a, a great show. But, but the honest truth is a lot of people just won't invest in what it takes to create that great show. So for those who aren't willing to invest to create a great show, maybe that investment just looks in terms of research and listening to a lot of shows and just getting a sense of, of what a good show can sound like. I think we're at 100, right? Because as we get more listeners into the podcast space, every time we lose a listener, that hurts, right? Because if they tune in and they hear a show that isn't great, they may not tune into other shows feeling like, oh God, if this is what a podcast is, no thanks, mm-hmm. right? So from, from that standpoint, I, I'd say we're at 100. Now... For the rest of the folks who are going to invest the time, energy, and resources in creating a, a really good show, I would say the more the merrier. And I would say the reality is that we're really just kind of scratching the surface. I mean, that may even be like a 10 or a 12 or a 15 in terms of the number of really great shows that we can have. All you have to do is look at um, Netflix or look at Amazon Prime or look at Hulu and the reality is, you know, there's a lid for every pot. And so plenty of opportunity for folks to create 
their own show, no matter what it is. And the more creative, frankly, the better, because there is a lot of stagnation in, in the podcast industry right now. A lot of shows just sound the same. Me too. And yeah. frankly, yeah. A, and frankly, a lot of the shows have the same people on and you have this, this um, sort of incestuous pool uh, <laughs> of folks that people pull from. And, and I don't think that really does the industry a whole lot of good either. So, oh man, if people can get a little more creative right. about what they're doing and even more creative about the people that they bring on and the topics that they cover, then, then there's definitely room for, for more. Uh, no, no doubt at all about that. And, and, I, and I hope that people hear this comment for what it's really meant to be, which is just a comment that is, that is totally intended to up-level the industry as, as a whole mm -hmm. and to, to take us out of this hobbyist kind of closet world of just being this, this cute little thing you can do and, and really treat it like a, a fundamental part of your business that drives visibility, leads, and revenue. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to piggyback off that a little bit, as we say on Clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things that's been fundamentally uh, helpful for me is, you know, when an entrepreneur or hobbyist starts any new project, say it in this case, someone listening is like podcasting, and they hear everything that you said, and it should serve as real true inspiration to make sure you're not fucking around and you're not just copying somebody else. Fortunately and unfortunately, sometimes that's the only way people know how to get started. They need a model. We all need a model. But that model that we are trying to emulate should only serve as like, I think of it as like the foundational structure. The only thing you should be looking at my show or Steve's show or Lewis Howe's show or Tim Ferriss's show for is what is the foundational structure and there's so many different types of shows. But what you really ultimately have to do is say, how do I bring that combination of what I do best, which sounds like such a cliche, but it's absolutely true, to the conversation? For me, what guides who I have on my show is people that I find fascinating. If I don't find that person fascinating and think that I can dive into a conversation with them and actually flow and get lost in an active state of just pure flow, then I don't think I'm going to actually enjoy that conversation. That's my filter. And there have been times that I've passed on people that are part of that incestuous pool that I'm just not interested in, at least right, not right now, until I think we can have a conversation that actually matters, that I can really truly become fascinated by their expertise, by the person. And with you, I mean, the example is like, I see what you're doing on Clubhouse. I'm fascinated by Clubhouse. I'm fascinated by you and the brand that you've built. It's like, no brainer. Like that's a conversation I want to have. But last week it was with a psychiatrist talking about suicide prevention. Like what's the through line there? The through line there is what does Armand find fascinating? What can he pull out and have a genuine conversation around that is authentic and allows people to be part of this, this flow state that I often talk about? Not a conversation about the psychology of flow, but one in which there is actually flow occurring. Each person has to come up with what it is for them. And I think often we go, oh, okay, you know, I'll do my own version of flow. I'll do my own version of like talking about podcasting. Do you know how many shows there are trying to do that same thing? And so we have to sit down and I think take what you said as inspiration of like, how do I really sit and get creative around this? And by the way, one more thing is like, my show recreates itself every single day, just the way I'm sure yours does too. Like every interview, every episode and every day is another data point that allows us to think about how does this show evolve? It should never just stay the same. Like my show is about to go to live streaming. Everything's going to be live as of probably a week or two from now, all done on StreamYard, setting up a new studio. I don't have the art up yet, as you can see, kind of doing something similar to you, got the DSLR getting set up. Like it's evolving. I'm going video first now, you know? So it's like, it's very important to be thinking about these, these little things. So, so that's on the podcasting side. I'm curious, Steve, like what about on the listenership side? There is so much research that says that is only growing and continuing to grow. Spotify is obviously making a huge bet on that continuing to grow. I don't think they've seen the return on that investment that they wanted to see so far, as far as I can tell. But what do you think as far as the, the listenership side? In, in terms of growth and, yeah. and where, yeah. So look, the, the, 
the fact of the matter is that we're sitting in about 112 million households on a, on a monthly basis in the U.S. right now. That's phenomenal growth. I mean, when we first started uh, talking about where the pod, uh, podcast landscape was, and I started teaching around this in, in around 2016 or so, really actively teaching around mm -hmm. it. I want to say that listenership was around 40 million, if I remember my stats correctly. So in, in a matter of just four or five years, that's that's grown, you know, what is that, almost 3x. Yeah, it's right? a stock I mean, you would buy. Pretty, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> substantial. So so I think that we're starting to, to see the, the, the rewards from that growth as podcasters, for sure. I mean, you're starting to see numbers that that rival other channels for sure and you're starting to see revenue come into the space that rival other channels for sure so growth can still happen if we're talking about 300 million americans and people who are over the age of 12 i believe that pool sits at around 200 million or so so there there's still mm. the potential for another 70 odd percent uh, of growth here with the medium in terms of uh, of people over 12 that live in the states so that that's still pretty significant but it's more than that i mean really the the beautiful thing about podcasting is you can reach almost anyone almost anywhere at almost any time yeah. So that means it's a global opportunity for you. I mean, we're starting to see more people come in and listening to our shows from the continent of Africa, from yeah. the continent yeah. of, of, of Australia, from uh, English speaking. I don't speak uh, another language on the show. So the English speaking people in, in Europe and in the other countries, et cetera. Uh, I mean, our Canada listenership, our Canadian listenership continues to grow. Um, uh, man, I just, I, I just, I, I really feel like there's just so much more room here to, to continue to grow for those who's, who stay the course, but, you know, look at the end of the day, you got to go where the people are and, mm -hmm. and, and we can't sit here and, and ignore what's going on with a platform like clubhouse, which I know we've talked about here and we can talk about it even deeper, but the reality yeah, is when yeah, people are, are spending time listening to conversations on clubhouse, what they're not doing is they're not listening to podcasts. Right. So a lot of people are saying, Oh, my podcast listenership is growing and, and I'm using clubhouse to drive people to my podcast and my inter Instagram following is growing and my Twitter following is growing and, and, and all that. Well, that's, that's all well and good. Uh, until it stops growing because clubhouse becomes more of a self-contained environment where now you don't go to Instagram or you don't go to Twitter and you connect directly on the platform itself. So you don't need to do that. And the conversations that you're having, you can have those conversations directly on, on clubhouse. So I know for us, we're, we're actually combining the two because there, there's a lot to be said for you know, the whole FOMO. It, like that, that's really what's driving, I think, to a large extent, what's driving Absolutely. Clubhouse is just that whole fear of missing out, right? If I'm not on and I'm not hearing the conversation, I can't, I can't hear it. But what happens yeah. when Clubhouse adds a recording feature? What does and, happen? <laughs> and it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're already recording. We're, we're saying we're recording. We actually do our episodes of Reinvention Radio live on Clubhouse now. I don't do them like you and I are doing it here at all. Yeah, how I do, do you it do it technically? I'm, I'm actually really just selfishly curious. Yeah, so um, real easily, uh, I actually put my whole setup at bit.ly. So it's a bit.ly link, bit.ly forward slash club pod with a capital C and a capital P. You got to capitalize those. Bit.ly is kind of funny mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, um, but, that but it's, cool. it's very simple. It's, uh, it's a Rodecaster Pro. Uh, it's a TRRS cable that feeds in directly into the uh, into the jack. That jack goes in the back of the roadcaster. Then it connects through a, a typical uh, dongle into your into your iPhone, and you use a microphone like I'm using here. Mm -hmm. Throw it in through one of the channels. Hit record with the micro SD card directly on the roadcaster Pro, and that's it. So I mean, like I've got everything in right now. I mean, like you know, like. 
This is where normal comes to die. Mediocrity meets its final right? demise. So, I mean, I've got, the you know, quo is I've got reinvention radio, like right here in the Roadcast Pro. Radio. So, now, bam. Here's your yeah, host, yeah, yeah. Here's your host, Steve, Steve Ulster, blah, blah, blah. So, um, the point being that what I'll do is I'll just fire it up right there. I'll record. I'll do it live on Clubhouse. And we've got the exit and the whole nine. And it'll end up being a full-blown episode right there in clubhouse that we then repurpose. So we're combining the, these the are generally live. solo episodes. Nope. I'll bring people on. You bring people on. Okay. Yeah. And so it's like people that, um, on clubhouse are like, I'm basically getting to tune into this episode live. Like that's the value for being there. Yeah. They're not yeah. jumping on stage and interacting with you, but they are getting to uh, engage with the episode live. Essentially. Nope. Both. They're doing both. So I actually bring them up. So like we had Pat Flynn on, we had Michael Stelzner on, we had other people on. They have the opportunity to listen and be a part of that live conversation. And then they have an actual opportunity to be a part of the conversation by mm -hmm. bringing them up on stage and they get to ask questions as well. As a matter of fact, I, I prefer it that way because some of the best questions come from the, the people who are in the audience. So yeah, we, we completely combine the two. Wow. Brilliant. And that's just a temporary solution until Clubhouse allows for recording, essentially. Um, yeah. And yeah. so there's no there's no technical issue with recording. I know that's a common question people ask. Apparently, we're not supposed to. But if you tell them you are, it's OK. How would you address yeah. that for people that are like, worried about that? Yeah. So the terms of service, those are pretty clear. You just have to say that you're recording. You have to say that in the title. You have to say that in, in the description. You should say it when when you first start so that if people come up on stage, mm -hmm. well, then they know that they're being recorded and they're ostensibly giving you permission. And that's all it comes down to. Yeah, that's all it comes down to. Wow. And, and wow. as you said, at some point here in the not so distant future, they're going to allow you to record directly on Clubhouse. I think one of the better things that they can do is they can take it through an RSS feed and then shove it out directly into your podcast or your mm. Blueberry or your Libsyn or whatever you have, make it as seamless as humanly possible. And what they'll probably end up doing is they'll probably keep an index of those rooms as well. So if you go into Club Pod, for example, which is our, our, our club on Clubhouse, which has quickly grown into the largest podcast specific club uh, on Clubhouse, it's called Club Pod. What I believe will happen is that there will become an archive of all of those rooms that we open in nice. Club Pod. I don't think you're going to, you may see this on an individual basis. I don't know, but I think at least they'll start with the clubs and then you can go in and you can just listen to those uh, at any point. But mm. I'm, I'm not sure that's what they want to do. Mm hmm. I think it's probably better for them to give you the ability to record and then ship it out to you as opposed to keeping it and hosting it there in Clubhouse because I think that that kind of defeats the purpose of, of why Clubhouse works well. I wonder, do you, do, you know, if the FOMO um, aspect going away will continue to generate the same level of attention that Clubhouse currently has? I haven't sat and done the thought exercise in depth. Uh, I'm sure you have. Like, what do you think it's going to look like when they do bring that? Will people just simply go back to, well, oh, this is going to be recorded, so I don't need to be there present live. Or uh, Steve's just going to push this to Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'll just I'll just listen to it there. Like, what? what why yeah. do I need to go to Clubhouse to listen to it? Or why do I need to be there live? Like, if that continues. And you're already yeah. kind of doing that. So what happens when it's widespread and mm -hmm. essentially every podcaster is doing that? Or, yeah. or a lot of these clubhousers become podcasters, <laughs> essentially, because right. which is an archive of their recordings of their rooms. Which is okay too, because then ultimately they're all going to want to be a part of Podcast Magazine, which helps us. So that's not necessarily a bad thing is turning some of these clubhousers into podcasters. What I will say is there, there's always a time and a place. And the reality is, you can't rearrange your schedule every single week to be a part of what's going on live. I mean, you're just going to miss out on some stuff. And when you look at the size of the rooms, the fact of the matter is there's, the, the rooms can only hold so many people. 
So for a lot of podcasters, their numbers on their podcast is going to be far in excess of the number of people that would be in a room on, on any, any given day. I mean, the biggest room yeah. that I have personally led is a room of about 1500 people, mm-hmm. which, which is great, you know, and, and, and love those bigger rooms, but that is a bigger room right now on, on clubhouse. So I don't know, man. I, I, I think that you're going to see it just being as a nice compliment to, to the two. And, mm-hmm. and, and the reality is if you want to hear, you know, if you want to hear me speak and you go into a room and there's 12 people on stage, you, you might wait an hour mm. to hear me say two minutes of stuff. A lot of people are going to like that. A lot of people aren't going to want to continue with that. A lot of people aren't going to subscribe to that. So they're just going to go straight to reinvention radio or, you know, whatever it is if they actually want to hear me and, and my guests. So mm-hmm. there, I, I, I think just like video, you know, VCRs, right. Increase the total amount of, uh, of movie watching and, and just like Sirius XM, just mm-hmm. simply increase the amount of audio consumption. I, I just think you're, you're looking at a rising tide right now. And I think that you're really looking at, um, just the the ability here for more people to become fans of of audio and ultimately bounce between the two channels. I think you're right. I think everything's a trade-off. I think in this current stage, it's actually brilliant what they've done by keeping it in beta and a tight-knit community that's invite-only. I think it's brilliant that it's audio-only because I remember the first week I joined, holy shit, man. I joined January 1st, like first day of the year. 2021. And I don't think I did anything for a week. (laughs) Like I literally didn't, I mean, I was obsessed. And then I realized I need to get back to work. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what the strategy was other than, you know, I mean, I thought about it in the, in the sense that, you know, any new platform, it's important depending on who you are and what your goals are to be at the forefront. And, And you have an opportunity to build a new audience that could be worth a lot. And it could, and, and I, what I knew right away was that it was a deeper relationship than I've ever had anywhere else on any other platform. The yep. depth, the understanding that people had of me, of listening to my nuances of thinking and seeing my personality in full is far beyond anything that they would get, even on a podcast at times, because that, that was recorded, but in, a, in an Instagram video that's one minute long, no one really gets you. So I realized I was like, all right, I got to focus on this. But I think for so many people, it quickly becomes, well, what is my intention here? How do I tie this all together? And how do I make it work? What is your general clubhouse strategy? You've got rooms that you lead. You've got a club, which is a a, a very cool thing as well. I just signed up for my club and and got approved. But I actually have a hiccup. I could use your help on that. It like showed up that I got approved, but it won't show on my profile. I don't know what's going on. Um, Then you show up. It actually does show up on your profile. Do you see a little gray button at the bottom? Because they don't actually tell you. No. You don't see it. Yeah. I don't know. what. some kind of glitch. I emailed them. Hmm. They won't respond to me. I'm sure you you know the founders. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and I'm very excited for that because it's going to be an awesome, awesome club. Uh, it's just, it's going to be a club with on flow and we're just going to have conversations like this that are going to be like either with psychiatrists or podcasters, whatever it might be. Um, and then you jump into rooms and people wait two hours to hear what Steve has to say. That was a great example. I've seen that many times with, with various people or they'll join the conversation. Maybe you're just there to learn even at times. Mm -hmm. How does that all tie together into one cohesive strategy? Is there intention behind the way you're doing things? How often you're leading rooms versus how often you're, you're doing a club podcast room versus, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, to me, it's been a a surprisingly powerful relationship builder. Yeah. Right. In terms of being able to connect with people that I didn't know. I mean, a lot of people are there like, oh, you knew that guy. Right? No, I, I actually didn't know that person or man, woman, whatever. I just I just met him. I just met him here. Just seeing him here, listening to him here, joining their room. And I'm like, oh, this, you know, person's got some interesting stuff going on. Mm-hmm. So relationship building, number one. Right. I mean, that that's how I'm looking at it, is being able to connect with people totally that right. 
that I wouldn't normally be able to connect with. And being able to actually have a conversation with them is just so very different than leaving a comment or a like or a share or whatever it might be. So that's, that's number one. Number two, it is definitely a brand builder in terms of getting more visibility, eyeballs, eardrums on, on what we're doing through podcast magazine or through our shows. Um, and then even through our products and programs and services and being able to have conversations with people who can benefit from those offerings and then being able to, to move them into relevant offerings and, and, and building the mailing list. And, and I will say that um, I don't know what the current numbers are, but uh, there was a point in time where we were adding about 500 people to our mailing list every single day awesome. through Clubhouse alone. And of course, a lot of those people then end up becoming customers. Mm -hmm. So it's leads, it's revenue, it's, it's visibility. It, is, uh, it, it really is all about status elevation. Uh, and, and it's about connecting with people that I, I did not know before clubhouse right so mm -hmm. it's it's been I, I, and man I, I will tell you i've been online a long time man i've been online almost 30 years we launched a store on CompuServe's electronic mall in 1993 I, i've never seen anything like it not in terms of the stickiness in terms of the engagement mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of the ability to generate uh, tangible results from your efforts i couldn't agree more I experienced something very similar during that two week stretch that I really was all in. Um, and, and I don't think that I've ever seen more um, reaction in terms of people taking action. You know, there's one thing when you create a piece of content on social media or you put out an episode of your podcast, you get a, you get a certain percentage of conversion, we'll call it in the marketing world of people taking action on the offer uh, on the, on the, whatever it is that, a value that you're giving them on clubhouse it's remarkable how high that conversion rate is like you say like i don't know tap my bio and go to that link and join my email list and it's like a lot of people do it a lot of people do it like it's a much higher conversion rate and i think it has something to do with the fact that you can't fake it on clubhouse it's like mm -hmm. what you see is what you get what you hear is what you get and people are more comfortable yeah. on audio than they are on video. People that generally, and I say this as well for people that are hesitant to, to ever speak, I, li I like to really push people to speak because it's like, Clubhouse to me is like the anti-social media platform in so many ways. You, you, you are socializing and you're coming together and you're networking, but anti-social media in the sense of like what it typically was to be like influential on Instagram or Twitter, is completely different on this platform. Like you can literally just show up kind of naked almost and be vulnerable and talk and be an introverted person. And it's completely okay. And people like it and appreciate it. And you develop relationships in a very surprising uh, way and at a very high rate. So I'm bullish on it as well. I just think it's going to be interesting to see, like, as you said, like the founders and the executive team, what decisions they make around <laughs> are, are they going to make it available on the platform? Are the recordings going to come soon? How long is it going to take? But I mean, I'm sure you saw this as well, Steve. It's like in the last week, the number of people that joined the app, like the notifications you're getting of like friends that were waiting on their invite. It I think it's probably doubled. I don't know. I'm just guessing, but I feel yeah. like it's just doubled in the last week. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, lots of great points and, and, at the end of the day, just like anything else, you, you got to figure out how it fits into right. your business strategy overall. And does it make sense for you to, to even do anything with it? And, uh, and for some people, the answer will be no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you talked about some of the things that you're leading people to converting people into customers. What's your primary focus right now in terms of offers, services, products that, that you ideally, like if I'm your customer, like what's the first thing I should do? Where do you want to leave? Um, yeah, man. I mean, look, the, the best thing and the first thing uh, for folks to do is just to join us on the pag, uh, podcast magazine ride. I mean, that's uh, it's a great opportunity for you to, to really see what we're doing uh, on a monthly basis. 
yeah, I mean, that's probably the best place to start. And, and, and certainly reinvention radio, our show is, uh, is, is another good place, but the, but the reality is, I mean, in terms of products or, or programs or services, uh, once a year, we do our profiting from podcasts launch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's coming up in, uh, in April of 2021 here. And, nice. and so we do that once a year and that that's, that's an entry point for a lot of people into, uh, into our world. Got it. So as a, as a company, what is the biggest revenue driver right now? Like when you just look at the company side of what you're doing, you see all these content efforts, how are yeah. you really planning on like blowing this business up over the next few years? Like where, where's the key driver? Yeah. The key driver is, uh, is our icon maker program. And that's the program uh, that we've been doing now for a number of years where we turn ordinary coaches, authors, speakers, entrepreneurs, podcasters, uh, really into icons of influence in their respective niche. People who are able to generate visibility, leads, and revenue at will uh, and be able to, to have opportunities come to them as opposed to them always having to chase the, the opportunities. And so that's, that's, uh, that, that's the main revenue driver for us. And we, we onboard you know, five to 10 new icon makers uh, into our program every month. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So, you know, when you're going about the business of podcasting, clubhousing, content, everything that you're doing, how, how do you look at your week? Like, what does your life look like in terms of how you're structuring the time? Because yeah. everything is a trade-off. And I know that you think deeply about how you're spending your time. And I know that you value personal time <laughs> as yeah. well and taking breaks and having some kind of lifestyle. So w- what does your ideal work week look like in terms of how you're distributing between being an executive, being a founder, being a leader versus being a content producer versus relationships and having some form of personal life? Right. Yeah, man. So, I, so I'm, I'm married. I've been married since 1997. Uh, we've got two boys still at home here. Uh, and so I, I would say that it's it's tricky. I mean, it's definitely challenging to try to balance it all. Yeah, uh, I've been much better about delegating over the last couple of years uh, than I ever have. And I do try to take Mondays uh, and Fridays off typically. So I, I try as best that I can to stick to actually a three-day work week. Mm-hmm. And so during those hours uh, on Mondays and Fridays, I'll, of course, occasionally kick on to, to Clubhouse and just see what's going on. Um, but the reality is I try to devote the majority of my time to just being the, the spokesperson, if you will, for the company, being the figurehead of the company, doing interviews like this, uh, and try to stay out of the weeds uh, as much as possible. And it's going to require at some points here to, to make less money than I would if I was doing it all myself. Uh, but at the same token, I have found that the, the more I let go and empower people to, to do the, 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 the work that needs to be done and take ownership of the, of the tasks that are at hand here, yeah. the, the more the business grows. And I know that seems really counterintuitive, uh, but I've actually made more money in the last couple of years um, as our team has grown than I ever did trying to do this as a solopreneur or, or with just one key person on the team. Mm-hmm. So as long as I can keep driving the vision and as long as I can get my sanity in place with doing jujitsu and, and, and spending time with the nice, kids nice. and trying to get away with the family uh, then, you know, everything else really does fall into place. But I'm not one of those people that blocks time mm. where, okay, from nine until 10, I do this. And from 11 till three, I do that. Like, that's just, that's just not me. I'm just Too not structured. that rigid. Yeah. 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 You would, you would lose your flow. <laughs> You'd probably exactly. feel imprisoned. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, the three day work week is um, something I've experimented with as well, or at least the four day one. And I do agree that it's insanely powerful because it's the power of constraints. It's counterintuitive. You do less, delegate more, you have less time, you focus on the most high leverage tasks. So yeah. how do you make sure you're high? Because I think there's a caveat. It's like having the right people. If you have shitty people, 
and you delegate to them, like it's all going to fall apart. So how did you find the right people and how do you develop the trust to start letting go? Because it sounds like you were probably in that world for a while where you wanted to do it all because it was yeah. the only thing you you knew, like so many of us, but then you learned to, to get rid of it over the last couple of years, you said. So how did that go? Yeah. I mean, at some point you just have to take a flyer and you just have to make the assumption that people are inherently good. And the reality is that some people will disappoint you. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, as a whole, people are, are genuinely good natured, right? And they genuinely want to find something that fulfills them. They want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, and ultimately, they want to be compensated at levels uh, that are commensurate with or much greater than what the average Joe or Jane is able to earn, right? Yeah. And so giving them that ownership and giving them uh, that ability to, to really take on a leadership role is, is something that you just have to get comfortable with doing. And, and a lot of people, frankly, never get comfortable with others making decisions. And I think as long as you have clarity around what are the, the, the bases of, of making those decisions, you, you'll be in a position where, okay, as long as you've been clear about what is most important to you in terms of the creator of the organization, Mm -hmm. most people are pretty darn good about upholding that vision and bringing it to fruition, albeit in their own unique way. Yes. But if you're, if you're a piss poor explainer of, of what it is that you want to do and what the KPs are, the KPIs are that you're looking to measure, well, you've got to take some time either to figure that out or hire someone who can help you to figure that out. And as long as people have the guidelines with which to work, you can then say, okay, you're either meeting these goals or you're not. And if enough months go by and you're not meeting those goals, then they're just not the right person. And mm -hmm. maybe they need to take on a different role in the organization, or maybe they just don't need to have a role in your organization. Man, that's a lot of wisdom right there. And that takes so many entrepreneurs years and years of struggle to learn. Uh, Cause one of the hardest parts is just getting out of the way. Like once you've done those foundational things that you just said, you painted the vision, you have clear KPIs of like, this is what success looks like. Now you need to learn to stop being transactional, right? With the delegation. It's like, I believe it's called transformational leadership where you essentially step back and you measure the goals at a higher level, not at the micro level. But that's the hardest part for most people because it's their baby and they want it to go exactly like how they envisioned it but it will always be a little solopreneur shop and it will have a ceiling to it until a person learns how to get, get completely out of the way and trust other people. Um, you've obviously been building this, this, uh, this company now um, for a while. How many team members are you at? I know I've seen some of them in, in a clubhouse as well. They, they support you in amazing ways, man. And so much yeah. of what they do is like, they're just independently driving it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a couple sides to that, right? There are people who are directly employed by our organization. And then there are people who are sort of representatives right. of the organization, so to speak. Like right now for Club Pod, as an example, I think we have 40 Club Pod leaders. Wow. Which means these are people who have been granted the ability to be admin of Club Pod and to lead rooms there on a consistent basis. So none of those people are compensated, but they're all compensated in terms of elevated status, in terms of visibility and credibility and authority, uh, and everything that goes with being a person who can do that through Club Pod. You then have a similar situation with Podcast Magazine. So we have 21 uh, category directors, people who are specifically responsible for a particular category mm. and own that category, so to speak, for Podcast Magazine. In other words, we have a, a category director for arts or a category director for business, et cetera. Now, these are all, um, I guess, for lack of a better term, volunteer-type positions. 
but we are really making them influencers and, and tastemakers in the industry. And that was our promise to them is we're going to give you the ability to have influence in the industry by owning that category. You're going to create the feature. You're going to create the overrated or under the radar uh, highlight of, of a show. You're going to make the selection for off the charts, et cetera. Mm. And so you're becoming the gatekeeper. You're becoming the tastemaker. You're becoming the person who is known as the the one who controls that particular category insofar as Podcast Magazine is concerned. So do they get paid directly? Well, actually, yes. I mean, but it's nominal. So they, I mean, technically they're, I guess, employees because we do pay them. It's nominal, but they get paid, mm-hmm. you know, for, uh, for the monthly contributions. But the real payoff for them is the branding, right? Mm-hmm. The real payoff for them is the designation. The real payoff for them is being able to connect with people that they wouldn't normally have the ability to connect with. I mean, one of our category directors just sat down with Guy Kawasaki and she was like thrilled. That same person just is now sat down with Jane Goodall and she's you know, thrilled. And it's just mm. like, it just opens doors that they wouldn't normally have to be able to open. So there, you have to think in terms of, of what the payoff is for your team. And, and sometimes it's not direct compensation. There's other right. ways for there to be payoff for them. But in terms of people who are actually on our payroll, so to speak, I think we're up to not many. I mean, I think it's six, six people right now uh, who receive consistent sort of payroll type checks from us. Um, yeah, six or seven, whatever it is, but it's not a massive team. Mm-hmm. Well, I love and that. Of course, we just, bring in a lot of contractors as needed for sure. 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 I, I just love the, the business model in so many ways, man. It's like, it doesn't all revolve around you. You've allowed people to make those connections directly. To, it doesn't all have to come back to Steve. It's not, yeah. you know, Steve engaging with Guy Kawasaki only. It's like you're giving the opportunity to these people because you know that that's a form of like value for them and a reason for them to contribute to your organization and it enhances their lives. And so I think that's why you are succeeding and going to continue to succeed because it's, it doesn't all come back down to you. And that takes such a, it it takes such a level of emotional intelligence and reduced ego because so many of the people we see in this industry, man, it's like, it's, it's all about them. It's all ego. The only reason they want a podcast is because they want it to be the, the John Doe show, you know, whatever it is. It's like, yeah. it, it all comes. And I'm not saying it's bad to have your name as the show. Don't, don't read into that too much. It's just like, you have to be willing to build something beyond yourself because otherwise, like you said, like no one's going to want to be part of something that's just all about you. People want to be part of something bigger, but, you know, not everybody's uh, Joe Rogan. And so you got to, you got to get real with yourself when it, when you ultimately sit down and you think like all all this effort, everything that you've done for so many years, you've been online for, you know, so long, uh, since the beginning, what is the driving force for you for why you do it all? Is it to hit a certain benchmark in terms of people reached, or is it for a certain amount in your nest egg to be financially free You know, is it, you know, what are the drivers for you? Yeah. And and it's a great question, man. And I would simply say that if you asked me this a number of years ago, it would have certainly been a hundred percent the money, Mm -hmm. right? A hundred percent. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat that at all. What I will say is that now that I have certain creature comforts, you know, the home with no mortgage and the paid for Mm -hmm. cars and, and those sort of things, it really is is about finding something that that fuels me and puts fire in my soul, you know, because at the end of the day, I'm not one who's just going to sit on a beach and do nothing for the rest of my life. Like I got too much to give. I've got too much knowledge and, and too much ability to to teach and to and to help people. So I'm, I'm not just going to sit here and, and, and rest on my laurels. I'll take it a little easier. Um, but you know, the same token, I still, I still have aspirations of, of, of being a, a name that people know globally, right? Like that's, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat that. Like I want to have a name that people know. So is that all ego? Is it what, maybe, 
you know, but I've always loved the spotlight. I mean, for me, I was a DJ way back in the day and, and spun in nightclubs and, and, and did the whole nice. thing. I mean, I've always just loved to entertain. I've always loved the spotlight. Now I have the ability to put the spotlight on so many others, which of course in turn puts the spotlight on me. Right. But right. at the same token, what, what really drives me is just finding something uh, that puts a fire in my soul. And, and if I can have that on the daily, then that's a life worth living. Otherwise, what the fuck else are we doing? Yeah, nihilism creeps in and it's over. <laughs> um, I, I love that honesty and I appreciate it because I think that every, not, not every single person, but for so many people, um, it's important to acknowledge that healthy part of the ego because the way you are describing it is incredibly healthy because it drives from a place of meaning. Like what is the point if Steve does not share the knowledge and wisdom and get his name out there, because in order to share that knowledge and wisdom and have the influence, that's necessary. It's, it's to build a brand. And that brand is the, uh, is the person, it's the personal brand, it's, it's podcasting related, but it's all of the above. And I think it's incredibly important to do all of it. I, I, I do wonder, you said you made the money, and I'm sure there's plenty more you would love to make, but you made the money, you had certain comforts and then you were able to start to think about what really fuels me which needs to come first there are so many arguments out there around do what you would do if money were no object follow the passion first the money will come but then there are other people that say no 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 if i get you the money like then you'll be okay and you can actually think about how you can contribute to the world like if you can make somebody rich first like this is a popular thing that Naval Ravikant talks about. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but yeah, sure. angelist guy, right? He's like, I'm going to teach you to be rich. I'm going to teach you to be happy, but I want you to get rich first. What do you think about that? Do you think that they need to go sequentially like that? Or do you think that it's possible to do what you're doing now and money doesn't lead, it follows? Yeah. Well, I mean, look, uh, and, and I'm going to have a hard stop here and just a couple of so we'll try to wrap if you can. But the, you know, the reality is for me, I, I don't believe that the two have to be mutually exclusive, right? I, I believe that you have the ability to do something that you love, something that you're great at, and something that people will pay you a lot of money to do all at the same time. And so it doesn't, to me, it's not a chicken and an egg. You, you don't have to get rich first in order to then start doing what it is that you really want to be doing. I, I believe that mm -hmm. you can get very wealthy doing what it is that reflects how you're naturally wired to excel. I mean, that's what my whole book, what is your, what is about? I mean, it's exactly right. that is, is finding that intersection where the, the, con, the concentric circles overlap of what you love doing, what you're really great at and what somebody will pay you exceptionally well for. So, yeah, I mean, to me, that seems like, and, and how do you define rich anyway? At what point <laughs> are you rich? You know, I mean, that is that a million in the bank? Is that 5 million in the bank? Is that 10 million in the bank? Well, good luck. Cause I guarantee you, as soon as you identify what that number is, you draw that line in the sand. Guess what you do? You move that line in the sand farther down. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. you start Absolutely. playing that game. You never win. Well, I'm very glad you mentioned the book um, because I'm a big fan of the concepts. And uh, when we first met, I grabbed a copy. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, this is awesome. Let's keep it up on clubhouse yeah, everywhere. I'm happy to support everything you're doing. Um, what's the best place for people to, to go to get started? Uh, I would, magazine? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Podcastmagazine.com slash free uh, is a private backdoor link to grab a free lifetime subscription to the magazine. And, and we'd love for people to go there for sure. Absolutely. Please do, people. Steve is the man. Thank you, Steve. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Appreciate you. All right, my brother. Take care. Keep up the great work. You too.